Um, so I'm going to be talking about design thinking today. Um, this is a word that I think is on everybody's minds. I hear it all the time. Uh, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's not such a good thing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and I'm also really happy because I feel like the talks that came before have really set up a lot of the themes um, that I want to address, so I really appreciate that as well. So um, I want to start with um, the, the rise and the predictable fall of design thinking as sort of a trend or as kind of a fad, um, and then I'll, I'll kind of move out from, from there. Um, so a lot of people sort of see the origin of this or some of the key thinking of this uh, in, in Tim Brown's work. Uh, in 2008, he published a highly influential article in Harvard Business Review on design thinking, and he followed it up a year later with his book, Change by Design, uh, in 2009. Uh, and in that article, Brown defined design thinking as a methodology that imbues the full spectrum of innovation activities with a human-centered design ethos. By this, I mean that, does, that innovation is powered by a thorough understanding through direct observation of what people want and need in their lives. And he defined five qualities of a design thinker's personality, empathy, integrative thinking, optimism, experimentation, and collaboration. He also represented design thinking as a cycle of inspiration, ideation, and implementation, made up of sub-cycles involving explorations of the design space, framework development, prototyping, evaluation, and dissemination of case knowledge to the rest of the business world. Two diagrams in particular from this era um, have been especially widely circulated. One was Tim Brown's three-circle diagram of desirability, viability, and feasibility, which is spread around so much online that some people don't even know where it came from and seem to think that it's just a fact of the natural world at this point. Um, but it was central to Brown's thinking about design. And he wrote, put simply, it is a discipline that uses the designer's sensibility and methods to match people's needs with what is technologically feasible and what a viable business strategy can convert into customer value and market opportunity. The other diagram that I've seen many, many, many times is the standard D school representation of the design thinking process. Many of you have seen this. Some of you have probably even used it in your own presentations. To me, it looks a lot like good old-fashioned user-centered design as it has been described in HCI textbooks for decades. It's not a radical new vision, but rather a model of a widespread and well-understood practice. So given the proliferation of the term design thinking, the use and reuse of these images, and the way the whole thing came to feel like it was some kind of a movement, it kind of meant that a backlash almost was inevitable. And if you go online today, you can find very, very easily articles that have titles like this, the top three reasons you hate design thinking. Uh, some of them are slightly less polite. Why design thinking is bullshit. Um, I like that this comes from a site that's actually called It's Nice That. And my personal favorite goes to Professor Lee Vinsel, who compares design thinking to syphilis. So apparently design thinking killed Nietzsche. Um, there are some, thanks, appreciate that. Um, there, there are some uh, more, more lengthy critiques of design thinking you can find online as well. This one uh, was just from last month by Natasha Iskander, um, who argues that design thinking is fundamentally conservative and preserves the status quo. Um, and while in, in, in many ways I'm sympathetic to that kind of argument, um, I, I will critique this a little bit. I, and I realize that you can't read this, but, but in this paragraph that I've circled here, she offers some critiques of design thinking. Uh, and, and she says that design thinking is poorly defined, that the case for its use relies on anecdotes rather than on data, that it's little more than basic common sense that it's repackaged and then marketed for a hefty consulting fee. So these are some of the, uh, the criticisms that are leveled at design thinking. Bruce Nussbaum, who at one point called himself an evangelist of design thinking, changed his mind. And he wrote this piece called Design Thinking is a Failed Experiment. So what's next? Happily, he tells you what's next. And it's in his upcoming book on uh, creative intelligence, or CQ. Um, and actually, Iskander makes a similar move. She also, uh, in, in uh, dismissing design thinking, proposes an alternative, which she calls interpretive engagement. Uh, and then she offers a description of that. But again, that description to me looks an awful lot like what we've been talking about for decades as user-centered design with a dollop of participatory design thrown in to make it a little bit more uh, democratic. So 
I'd like to respond to the story as an academic, and I'd like to, to kind of talk about three different perspectives from which I do that, because I do kind of have different roles or different hats. So I am myself a design researcher. Um, I do a lot of research on aesthetics of interaction, innovation and creativity support, as well as critical approaches and humanistic approaches to human-computer interaction design. Uh, actually, my research is quite a bit about what Poppy talked about, critical design and speculative design. Um, but I'm also a design educator, uh, and that means that I have to kind of walk a fine line between preparing students to enter industry and preparing students to, to thrive over an entire career. And those are two different perspectives that are often in tension with each other. Uh, and some of the courses I teach are experience design, intro to HCID, interaction, culture, uh, and, and some others as well. Finally, I administrate the HCID program at IU Bloomington. Um, so I am an administrator. That means that one of my jobs is I'm in charge of the curriculum. We have a bachelor's of science. We have a master of science. We have PhD programs. Uh, and what does it mean to be in charge of a curriculum? I found this nice quote. Curriculum is a consensus building process by which faculty articulate the values, content, activities, and evidence of learning. So those are the kind of perspectives that I bring to this. And now I'm going to critique a little bit um, uh, design thinking a little bit, but maybe not in, immediately in the way that you think. Um, some of you know that I have a blog, uh, and this is a screenshot from a blog. I recently wrote a post called Criticality Need Not Be Negative. Um, and I think it's really important that one of the roles of, of, of criticism, um, somebody talked about this earlier, was it, was it Anna or was it, I don't remember, sorry. Well, it might have been Pop. It, it was Anna, okay, talked about the role of the importance of design criticism. That criticism is not intrinsically negative, that criticism actually starts as I argued here, from uh, I, what I called an aesthetics of skillful sympathy or of scholarly appreciation. Um, and so you can say negative things, but you should start from the stance of, of something a little bit more sympathetic. And so that's how I would like to start by um, talking about this particular vision of design thinking that's been so influential in our recent past. So what I think that Brown, IDEO, and the D School at Stanford have done is that they found a, mo a mode of articulation that has had real impact in organizations throughout the world not just in design, but also in businesses and governments. I do some research, for example, in, in Asia, and I know that governments in China and Taiwan are also talking about design thinking and using the same language and are inspired by many of these same ideas. And I think in order to do that, they had to do something pretty special, which was to find a way to integrate the substance of, of what design is and what designers do to make it accessible, to make it persuasive, and to create desires that didn't exist before, to make people want to do this, to make people yearn for it. And I think that's really uh, uh, an achievement, and I respect it as such, and I think that we all should do that. Um, but that said, I do have some practical concerns, as, as in the roles that I specified earlier. So this quote, which I'll read out to you, um, is, is actually how Tim Brown ended that article on design thinking. He, he wrote, no matter where we look, we see problems that can be solved only through innovation, unaffordable or unavailable health care, Billions of people trying to live on just a few dollars a day. Energy usage that outpaces the planet's ability to support it. Education systems that fail many students. Companies whose traditional markets are disrupted by new technologies or demographic shifts. Design thinking is just such an approach to innovation. So I understand that he's not literally claiming that design thinking is going to fix poverty and climate change and educate everyone and also make us all rich. But I do feel that this is a very optimistic quote. Um, and I do think that when the field fails to deliver solutions to these things, because I don't think there are solutions to these things, um, that there's going to be a backlash. The other side of it, and Anna has talked about this earlier, so I was really happy that she brought this up, um, is that the, the design thinking movement, or, or however you want to call it, has, has, by making it accessible, by making it appealing, has also very much simplified what it is that design thinking is. And this is an image here from Walter Gropius. This is from the Bauhaus in the 1920s. Um, and this is a representation of the curriculum uh, that they had there. And in the Bauhaus, the curriculum, uh, they had a one-year preliminary course uh, where students focused on colors, shapes, and basic materials. In the second year, they, they moved on to st the studies of nature, uh, studies of advanced materials. By the third year, they moved into workshops. They were doing metalwork. They were doing woodwork, this kind of thing. And only by the fourth year were they allowed to actually start talking about and start studying architecture, which was at the heart of all of this. And 
I should also mention most of them failed out on the way. So only a minority of them ever actually made it all the way into the inner sanctum. And when you contrast that with this diagram, which I could teach anybody to understand and to use in a week, um, you, you kind of get a sense of attention here. Um, in a hot UX market, what constitutes the minimum qualifications? How can I ask? So I've, I put the timelines here of different programs. So the Bauhaus is a four-year program. Our master's program is a two-year degree. Uh, our competitors, CMU and UW, offer 15-month degrees uh, at master's degrees. Uh, General Assembly, you can take a 10-week course. Um, so there's different temporal scales here uh, and, and different sorts of degrees and that kind of thing. And so I think the, the question is I, I, that, that I have to deal with as a program director is, why should, why should anybody spend two years in my program if they can spend 10 weeks at General Assembly and they don't even have to leave home? And I've got to find some real way to answer that question. Um, so where does design learning happen? Does it happen in the school? Does it happen in the workplace? And how long does it take? And what are the consequences when we decrease the time that people spend in school? And so I think there's a combination. These two points that I've raised, I think they actually uh, create an unfortunate tension with each other, or a kind of vicious cycle. One is we have an oversimplification of inputs. If we believe that you can take a one-week intensive program to become minimally qualified, and the purpose of your job is to solve health care and poverty, you kind of can see what I'm saying, that, that on the one hand, we're, we're, we're trying to lower the barriers to entry. I support that. I want to democratize design. Please don't think that I'm, I'm casting shade on General Assembly or anything like that. That's not my intention. Um, but I, I, I want us to be reflective about these different temporal scales and the expectations of the claims that we as a field are making. So the argument that I want to make, I appreciate what design thinking has done for the field. Uh, it does seem to be at a point where it's starting to feel passe. There's starting to be frustration or criticism of the term. Uh, it's starting to be a bad thing. And how do I know it's a bad thing? Because right now our university is just now creating courses called design thinking. So that's how you know that it's past its, uh, past its prime. So we don't need a new fad. What I think we need is a thoughtful engagement with design practice across history and across subdisciplines. And I also want to see much more engagement between industry and academia. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here today. So what I'd like to do is now step back and talk a little bit about HCID. As I mentioned, I am a, an administrator of a program. And one of the things that I do is I have to introduce what HCID is. And this, one of the stories that I tell is that HCID is a convergence of two disciplines that have different histories that are increasingly coming together and, and, and being intertwined. So it's a picture of two things coming together. Uh, and I represent it using this timeline. Uh, so, and I realize that it's probably hard to read, but it does stretch from 1800 to about the present. It, of course, it's going back to 1800 because we are looking at the origins of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then there's a, a list of different inventions that happen in there. One of the more, more significant inventions is around the 1970s, the graphical user interface uh, becomes widespread. Uh, and that's, these two moments are, are historically important, as, as I will show. So design, if you look at a, a, a history book of design, a picture book of design, it doesn't matter what kind of book on design, typically they do talk about design going back to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, prior to that, there were practices of making clothes, of making buildings, but, but for some reason we tend not to think of it as design uh, in the modern sense until after about 1800. Uh, and we often talk about it in terms of schools, and we talk about movements. We talk about uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts, we talk about the, the Bauhaus, Art Deco, mid-century modernism, that kind of thing. And when we think about it as a discipline, we also typically talk about a set of sub-disciplines, which include product design, industrial design, fashion, architecture, graphic design, interior design, urban planning, and, and several other disciplines as well. Um, and then we also tell kind of a shared history of certain movements. So we talk about uh, William Morris and the, and the Victorian arts and crafts movement as a reaction against mass production. We have the Bauhaus and Bauhaus modernism and the elevation of, of taste, a geometric form. We have Frank Lloyd Wright and his organic architecture and, and obviously lots of uh, modernism here in this image. We have the post-war design of someone like Raymond Levy uh, who, who looks at the streamline, who looked at the speed uh, of, um, I don't think we're really halfway. I hope we're not halfway. 
Not according to my clock. I'm only 14 minutes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Raymond Levy, uh, who talked about, who, who was looking at the, the excitement over travel, over, over engines, of jets, and then tried to translate some of that into lifestyle products like this pencil sharpener. Um, and so just to step out, if you look at design research, and now I'm kicking myself for not including Papanek, but anyway, uh, here, so add that mentally. Uh, but several of the major themes, the major topics, what are the contents of, if you read design research books, what are they about? They are about things like design cognition or design thinking, about reflective practice, about how one moves from a novice to an adept to a master, about wicked problems, about problem framing versus problem solving, about artifacts and materials and products and their ecologies and design precedents and exemplars, about reaching out into the world with social design and co-design, democracy and social responsibility and major themes of aesthetics and style, of meaning and form and craftsmanship. Uh, these are some of the things that come up again and again in these books. What I'd like to do now is switch over to HCI, because HCI has a different history. HCI is typically located in the moment that the graphical user interface uh, becomes a common thing, because suddenly the use of computers is transformed from only people who are uh, very technical computer scientists or, or engineers to the general population. And HCI also has movements and history, and I'll briefly summarize some of those. Uh, I'll also show an image from HCI, and this is quite a very different sort of image than the Frank Lloyd Wright or the Raymond Levy sorts of image, but this is somebody using an early graphics processor. Um, and so typically, if you read the literature, HCI talks about uh, itself as having three different eras. Uh, and the first era is often in the 1980s. It's referred to as information processing. I'll unpack each of these. Uh, in the 1990s, there's this emphasis on context and situated action, uh, contextual computing, and after, the, after 2000, you start to see the rise of experience design and language like that. And how that translates is that certain IT domains are important and certain methodologies are important for each of these eras. So for information processing, there's an emphasis on the individual user, on usability testing, optimizing performance, uh, and some of the methodological traditions are, are coming out of cognitive science and engineering. By the 1990s, there are different, different issues are rising. People are interested in small teams. They're interested in collaboration and context and workplace studies. So suddenly sociology and ethnomethodology become important uh, approaches. In the 2000s, we have the rise of art and culture, domestic computing, experience computing, entertainment computing. And now we, have, we start to see a lot more influence from ethnography and from design into HCI. And if we do the same thing for HCI that we did earlier for design and sort of try to break out what are the contents of the research, you will see information processing, usability, experience design are some major purposes. Some of the, the approaches have to do with use and the user. We've seen a critique of that, which I agree with, but this is the language the field has used. User-centered design. I have a four-word definition of HCI that I use to introduce the program to our students, which is study users build shit. Uh, I, I stand by that. I do think that's the, that's the most elegant description of HCI uh, that, that, that I've, I, I know of. Uh, what does it focus on? It focuses on input and output, on interfaces, on interaction paradigms, such as windows, icons, menus, and pointers, or ubiquitous computing, or uh, natural uh, interfaces. It reaches out into the world, too. It talks about social computing, computing in the wild. It uses contextual inquiry. And some of its topics are task models, distributed cognition, and affordances. And when you put these two side by side, you can see that they're not the same. You can see that they're different, but that they also do speak to each other. And as Christopher said in his earlier thing, they do form into sorts of traditions. They do share a theory. They do share approach. Uh, each has objects. Each reaches out to the world. Each is characterized by key ideas. Uh, and further within each, you can say there's a kind of a coherence. The deep coherence within design is this idea of somebody having a good eye and very good hands, who's experienced with destructuring and restructuring design elements, such as materials, stakeholders, tasks, practices, and rules, to improve the social world and or to shape the artificial world. The deep coherence in HCI has been something more like information processing, which is the cybernetic loop the structured flow of information between humans and machines to accomplish a purpose or a task. And measuring task completion time becomes an indicator of processing speed and also the success or the efficacy of that cybernetic loop. 
So I want to, whoops, I have a transition. No, I don't have a transition. Okay, that was off, a little bit abrupt. But anyway, that's how I sort of see our field as the convergence of these two traditions. I do see them interweaving and coming together and, and speaking to each other more. Um, but I also want to stress, and, and uh, Christopher also uh, has already alluded to this, and I'm going to recycle even one of his quotes um, uh, earlier, but this notion of design thinking was not invented by IDEO, was not invented by Stanford, uh, but actually it goes back much further. There's been academic research uh, going back for many decades about the nature of design. Uh, the British government invested a lot of resources uh, and a lot of scientists have worked to study designers, to study master designers, to study design protocols, to try to understand what it is that designers do. Uh, and this has led, led to a sophisticated uh, body of research about how, how designers learn. So what does this literature say? Um, well, it typically refers to design thinking as the distinctive cognitive style of designers. Uh, it's sometimes also a way of approaching situations that involves a combination of human-centered methods and rapid sketching and prototyping from the beginning and throughout the process. So Herb Simon offers a very famous definition of design, which is that everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And there's sort of three things that I would like to point out about that. And I think Christopher has already um, gestured in this direction, so I feel like I'm, I'm just reinforcing what he's already said. That what designers devise is courses of action, not designs. That second, that they don't, they're not solving problems, but they are confronting existing situations, not problems, and they are converting them into preferred situations, not solving them. So there's this very important language that he uses. It's not the language of solving problems and not the language of making things, uh, but is, is something else. And so I want to focus on this notion a little bit of existing situations because there's been some interesting research from this community where they would give the same design brief to a classroom full of engineering students and a classroom full of design students. And they would do a protocol analysis to see how, how they behaved. Um, and what was really interesting was that the engineers would start to ask questions and they would collect relevant information. Um, and they would attempt to determine constraints and they would attempt to determine requirements. The designers, they wouldn't even finish listening to the brief. They were already drawing. They were already solving the problem. Um, so the very different epistemology, very different way of thinking about how to approach something. And one of the key ideas that comes out of all this is this idea of a wicked problem, which has been alluded to earlier. Um, I think all of you probably have heard this idea before, but a wicked problem uh, is, well, I'll just go ahead and give some examples. Some examples of it would be social policies, or domestic violence, or urban planning, or even IoT protocols and standards. That these are, the, these are the types of things that have incredible complexity. You only get one shot at them. They don't have a definitive solution. They don't have a stopping rule. There's only better or worse solutions. There are not true or false solutions. And you only get one chance. So you can, you can lower, lower taxes, or you can raise taxes. But you, it's kind of hard to divide the population in two and do an A-B test with taxing. And so this has then led to a distinction between design framing and problem solving as a way to confront or to deal with wicked problems, where instead of trying to, to only think about a solution, you actually dwell on how you frame it or how you interpret or how you structure a problem as a problem. Nothing is a problem until it's actually framed as one and you can only solve problems that have been framed as such. And one of the interesting findings of this research was that designers treat all situations as if they're wicked problems, whether or not that's how it's presented to them. It's a disciplinary move that the first thing they do is they act as if it is a wicked problem. And uh, Case Dorst, oops, crash. Uh, Case Dorst is one of these scientists who's done this work, and he's written a book called Frame Innovation, which I highly recommend. Um, and he actually talks about the design thinking process uh, in this way. It, it has five different steps, and this is a little bit different than what you see in the, uh, the IDEO Stanford model. Um, so he starts with a problematic situation, much like uh, Simon, Simon does. And the first step is paradox. And what he means by that is that there is some reason why this problem has been hard to solve in the past. And so the first step really is to try to understand why is, this, why is this a tough problem? What is it about this problem that makes us really struggle with it? 
The second step is, is what he calls thematic analysis. And basically thematic analysis, I won't read the whole quote for time, but the idea is that you're trying to get below the surface. You're trying to get at a deeper level. What are the underlying human needs that are going on here? What are the practices that are happening? What are the deep conflicts? What are the deep opportunities? Um, in other words, what are the depth issues that are driving the surface features? Because once you can see those themes and you can name those themes, then you're in a position to do the sort of the golden thing. This is what designers are hired to do, um, which is to frame problems, at least according to his book. And this is sort of the key move of innovation in this book, which is problem framing. And so inspired by these themes, the designer proposes alternative organizational principles for the problematic situation. These principles should be actionable. They should span a range of issues, and they should be stable. They should inspire and prompt new ideas. They should invite design moves, which people can sketch, people can concretize. So he gives this example. He gives this in journal articles in his book. He, he reuses this example a lot. Um, but it's a pretty clever example. So there's a pub in, in London that uh, at 2 AM, I don't exactly remember the time, so I'm making them up. But anyway, at 2 AM, everybody gets thrown out of the pub because the pub closes. But the nearby public transportation ceases operation at 1 AM. So at 2 AM, you've got a bunch of drunk young people who stumble out of bars. Uh, there's arguing, there's bickering, there's fights, there's public urination. Uh, there's all these different kinds of problems. The neighbors complain about it, of course. And so they say, please, police, do something. So they bring in the police. And what do you suppose happens? The fights get even worse because the patrons are now fighting with each other and with the police. And so it's even louder. It's even worse than it was before. Um, so the move then is to step away from that and to try to think about it a different way. Why are people going to pubs? Because they, they're not going because they want to fight. Nobody wants to urinate in public, probably. Um, they want to have fun. They want to be social. They want to relax with each other. So that's the deeper theme. That's the deeper need. So then the question is, how can we create an environment around the pub that supports that kind of thing? And the move then is to say, look, we design music festivals all the time. And there are toilets at music festivals. And there's transportation. And there's signage. And there's all this other stuff at music festivals. What if we use those same techniques here in the, in the case of the bar? And so as soon as you reframe this from a law enforcement issue to a designing a musical event issue, all of a sudden a ton of new moves come into view. And they're actually easy and they're affordable and you don't have to be a genius or design superstar or design author to see them. They're kind of obvious once you think that way. And then the last thing is to retain the pattern, is to communicate this, is to turn it into knowledge, share it with your organization, share it with other business and so on. So that's the view. Um, and this whole thing has been uh, represented, I'm going to go a little bit quickly here, um, in the form of, a, of what's called a double diamond diagram. And so problem uh, framing is on the left side, problem solving is on the right. And in both cases, there's an expansive move where you generate as many ideas as you can. And then there's a contracting move where you sort of select among the best ones and you refine and you develop the most promising ones. You do that for the problem frame. You do that for the problem solution. Um, and that's then how, how design works. And we have appropriated this in the HCID program. This image is actually guiding our curriculum design today for our MS HCID uh, degree. Uh, it's not our, we didn't invent the double diamond diagram. It actually comes from uh, the, the uh, design council in, in the UK. You can find it online. Um, but we have uh, appropriated it and redrawn it and added some new stuff to it based on our, our own values and our own experience. So this talk has a couple take-homes. Um, I'm now going to tell you what they are. One of them is longer than the other one, though. Uh, it's the first one. So the first one is this. If design thinking the way that IDEO or Stanford has been talking about it, if we're now starting to get a feeling that that's broke and it's no longer doing the work that we wanted it to do, then we should fix it. And here are some thoughts on how to do it. What I don't think we need is another fad. I don't think we need somebody to come along and relabel old wine with a new, a new name like uh, creative intelligence or, or whatever that was. Um, so here's the way I, I would encourage you to think about it. First of all, there's all these books out there in industry right now that you can find easily across the street in a bookstore, if you can find a bookstore across the street. Um, 
these, these different industry books, a lot of them are O'Reilly books, or Lean UX, Sprint, Strategic Design, these, these kinds of, of books. Um, and the advantage of these books is that they're very practical. They, use, they have current cases, current tools, current methods. They're easy to read, they're easy to practice. But the disadvantage of them is that they grow stale really fast. Uh, they're often really derivative. They repeat each other um, just to pieces. It's incredible how rep repetitive these things can become. Um, and so you might, in turn, turn to more serious books. These would be things like Don Norman, or Plans and Situated Actions, or Christopher Alexander, or Victor Poponik. Um, and these have advantage of having much longer shelf life. They're relevant for many decades. They're deeper. They have more powerful ideas. Uh, they translate deep and secure knowledge from science and philosophy into contemporary design. But the disadvantage is sometimes the ideas in those books are current and relevant long after the actual technologies and tools and examples they talk about. So sometimes I assign a reading like this and my students are like, why are we talking about muds and moose? That's like so 1991 or something like that. It's like because the idea is good. Um, they can be harder to read uh, and it can be hard to know which of these is going to be make a, uh, an enduring contribution and which is just gonna become a fly by night sort of thing. Then there's readings that introduce extremely powerful and durable ideas that shape knowledge for a century or more. And we often will think of these as academic books. So prose, they're relevant for centuries. They push the boundaries of human thought. They have nearly infinite potential applications. But cons, they can be really hard to read. My students get mad at me when I make them read Dewey. They don't even like reading my summary of Dewey, um, but too bad. Uh, it can be harder to apply, uh, and obviously they have no relation to today's tools, cases, and methods. What I want to encourage is that we look at these books as all related to one another, not see them as totally separate things in different areas of library or bookstore or Amazon, but actually as all part of a single system. In the top row, we can call it contemporary industry guidebooks. The middle row, we can call core theory of HCI and design. In the bottom row, we can call intellectual foundations. And if we're able to move down, practitioners are able to get a much deeper understanding of why the methods are what they are, how they're used, when they should be used, why they came into being and that kind of a thing, how to use them, how to defend them. If you move up, you can actually innovate new methods and new practices. Many of you are doing that. We're doing that in academia. Many of you are doing that in industry. Um, so I can apply this to the context of design thinking and say, Here's these ideas by IDEO that were a really big hit in industry in, the, in, in 2008, in that era. Then there were a zillion books that came out that had design thinking in the title. I had no trouble producing the rest of that image. I could have, I could have made it five slides wider. Um, whether or not they acknowledged it, that idea of design thinking actually sits on a lower set of theory about uh, Donald Shun's reflective practitioner, Nigel Cross's designerly ways of knowing, um, although frame innovation came later, it's based on research that has been going on for many decades. And there's a journal called Design Studies, which is basically about this topic. And it's been going on for many, many years. And there's a book version of like the greatest hits of Design Studies, and that's what that last one on the right is. And underneath that, I would say, are some really foundational texts, like Dewey's Art as Experience, which I think was profoundly influential on Donald Shun. Uh, for example. In fact, Donald Shun wrote his dissertation about John Dewey, so uh, there's, there's a very strong lineage there. And the other book is Karl Popper's uh, the, the Logic of Scientific Discovery, which has a lot to do with uh, um, the relationship between the limits of science, uh, which has helped design explain why it's not a science or why it would be reductive to, to call design science. So someday soon, maybe now, that might all blow up and catch on fire, um, and that's unfortunate. But something else can arise out of it, but that's something that can rise out of it will, will be coming from this deeper set of things. So to come back to this, this, this cr critical um, po post that Natasha Iskander, uh, that I mentioned earlier on, where she said design thinking is not well-defined, uh, it relies on anecdotes and data, uh, all this other kind of stuff, no, I don't think so. I think that design thinking rests on hundreds of years of people who have been doing 
these methods and these theories and these studies and have experimented and have learned and have shared it with each other. So I don't think it's vague and I don't think that it comes out of nowhere or that it's anecdotal. And I don't think that's the way to think about it. Um, so what I think is that this is how we should think about it instead. And this is what I invite you to do, whether in industry or whether you're in an academic context, move up and down this. As you're able to move up and down this, you can innovate, you can do new things, you'll get a deeper understanding of why the methods look the way that they do. You can become more creative with them, you can reuse them in different ways, uh, and in that sense you will contribute innovation and creativity to your organization. Here's my second take home. This one's the fast one, I promise. Uh, academics and industry can't be two worlds. We have to engage and inform each other. Um, one of the things I want to say is I want to work with you. I really mean this. Uh, especially in my role as program director. Um, there's a number of different mechanisms, there's a number of different structures that we can do that. You can visit campus. You can do an AMA with our students uh, or do a design hangout on Skype. Um, you can send us a question or a problem, let one of our students try to deal with it as their capstone. You can sponsor a class project, and by that I don't mean money, although we totally welcome your money. <laughs> Um, but you can give our students a design brief and let them work on it, come back and judge their work. Poppy is doing that this semester, and, and, and as is Ron. I don't know where Ron went, but anyway. Um, you, can, uh, you can invite one of us to come and give a talk, or to come and teach a method, or to, to do some kind of hands-on activity with you. Um, you can do a design sprint with us. Um, we can apply for a grant together and maybe tackle a problem for our state. We can develop and test a new method together. Poppy's been talking about speculative design. We're working on speculative design we should be talking. Uh, get in touch with our career services people and let them match you to our job and internship candidates. I say that for the students in this room. You know that I said it. Um, help me understand how HCID can help you. We are a resource in the state. We're not just an ivory tower thing. We want to engage uh, and so we should do that. So what is before and after design thinking to wrap this up? The histories of our intellectual disciplines are behind us. They're not and they are ahead of us. In the future, the Bauhaus mid-century modernism will still be part of our past. The theories, approaches, objects of inquiry, engagement with the world, and core ideas, these define us as a community of practice. Design thinking was never any more than this. Design thinking was a model of this. And we can produce new models if, the, if those aren't working. How designers and design researchers have come to understand the nature of wicked problems and devise effective ways to take them on, that's hard one. These ideas are not new. Design thinking drew from them, and whatever comes next will draw from them as well. Also, the scientists who study design practices, methods, and protocols have made contributions that have endured and will continue to endure for decades. In our program, as I mentioned earlier, we use this model. Not only does this reflect decades of research, in, of scientific research into the nature of design, it also reflects two decades of, of being in a program together. The same core faculty has been together for 15 years. We've learned a lot together, and we've brought that knowledge to bear, to redesign, to reshape, to do this. And what, why I say this, no, I don't think you have to adopt this diagram in your organization. That's not my point at all. All my point is that, and as Don Dubberly, Dubberly has shown, there's like a million of these models out there. You can, you can pick and choose. But my point is this is a living document here. This is not just a picture of the past or a dead theory. This is, this is driving our curriculum. This is shaping our debates in our faculty meeting today. So all of this, then, is before and after design thinking. The famous artifacts and influential designers, the design schools and their movements, the theories and approaches and objects of inquiry, the original breakthroughs, the explications of processes, the representations, and the ways these have all shaped our practices in higher education and industry alike. All of this is before and after design thinking. Don't let the bloggers let you forget it. We cannot cut ourselves off from where we've come from. Thank you. Hi, my name is Haley, and I'm a Purdue uh, undergrad in UX. Okay. Um, and I'm going through the process of you know, doing interviews and such for companies. Yes. And the same question I get all the time is, how do you define design thinking? Um, <laughs> so how would you um, kind of tackle that if you were me? Uh, if I were you, I was going to say, yes. if, it were, if I were me, I would take about 38 minutes to talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, 
But I think, I mean, I, I, that, that's why I think, that's why I think it's important not to be overly dismissive of what IDEO and the D School have done. Um, because I think one thing they've done is they have found a way to pitch it to people that will make sense and make people care about it. So my suggestion for something like that is to prepare answers at different temporal scales. You should have a 30 second answer, you should have a five minute answer, you should have a 60 minute plus with beers answer. Um, and they should sort of cohere, but that would be my, my approach. And really try to distill down and also personalize it a little bit. Because I do think one thing about design is that people do like designers to have a little bit of a voice or a little bit of a point of view. So they don't, if all of, if we, we have about 42 students in our, uh, in our, in each cohort in our program. And if we had 42 identical statements about what design is, I mean, that would kind of be lame. So um, you definitely want to add a little bit of personal uh, perspective or, or, or sensibility to it. Uh, so you mentioned um, that there's this divide between industry and academia, and I was wondering, is there, was there ever a time when there wasn't a divide or when the divide was smaller? Uh, um, and I mean, can you talk a little bit about how that's changed and maybe why? I'm just kind of curious, like, what, you know, what, if there's ever been an example where it was better. I, well, I think, there, there, I don't mean to overly, ex I don't want to exaggerate that, because industry and design and academia have always been tightly intertwined in different ways. But I think in certain contexts, they come into better alignment, in other contexts, they fall out of alignment. So IDEO and the D School would be a classic example of an industry academic alignment that gave us this, this version of design thinking. So I don't want to suggest that they don't, they're not there. I do feel, partly because we're in Bloomington, Indiana, that we are in a small town in the Midwest. We are isolated from some of the action, like in ways that, for example, Georgia Tech, UW, uh, Berkeley, and Stanford are not isolated. They're surrounded by, by lots of industry. And so I do think that in the, in the context of Indiana, I think we have a challenge. I think we can all do better um, to, to be more proactive to work more, work more here. One good thing that's happening is I think that a lot more of our graduates from our program are staying in Indiana than was true 10 years ago. Uh, and that's, that's because Indiana, I think, has really grown as a design city, and I think that's a, that's a really good sign, and it's a good thing for the region, and I hope to see a lot more of that. I couldn't imagine this event 10 years ago. Um, but, uh, and in the context of HCI, if you look at uh, who funds HCI and how it's paid for, it's very much the big, uh, you know, Google and Microsoft and, and, and uh, uh, eBay and places like that do pay for the CHI conference uh, or, 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 or they subsidize the CHI conference. Um, so I don't want to suggest that they're not. But, I, but at the same time, I do hear students uh, and, and even sometimes ourselves speak as if we are from different worlds. And I just want, I, I at least want to, I want to flag it. I want you, if, if you see yourself doing it, if you hear somebody doing it, just at least red flag it and ask if that's really the best way to talk about it. Um, because I, I, I don't think that has historically been the case, um, and I don't think it's a desirable thing. So I, I just want to encourage it. And, and I mean, for, for someone like me, I do a lot of very academic talks. I'm not even sure that this talk will count um, at the end of the year for my evaluation because it will be non-academic. And like that's the kind of thing that just doesn't make sense in an applied professional school. Um, but that's, that's part of my reality, and you will have similar realities as well. Uh, if, if, if you're in an environment where it's like, we need answers now, uh, there's no budget for this, we did no time to do real research. I mean, some of you have talked about that. This, I'm sure, Liz, that's your life, is dealing with that, right? And so academic research is the thing that they don't have time for. But in a way, the thing that Liz is arguing that, in fact, they must have time for is not so different than what we do. Uh, as well, so I, I just want to try to challenge that uh, and 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 to encourage integration, especially in Indiana. <laughs>